Good morning and welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Augusta. I'm Jezebel Anon. I'm your worship host for today and I'm really excited about this service. A wonderful start with our musical director, Joseph Patchen. Those of you on Zoom, you are more than welcome. We invite you to stick around after today's talk, about 15 minutes or so afterwards, so people here can get some coffee. There will be an after-service discussion. 
Zoom people. We're going to have a mic here, so please stick around for that. We are excited to have that again in this service. Those of you in person, please silence your phones or any other devices. For newcomers, please fill out the blue card in the seat pocket near you, put it in the collection plate, or give it to me or someone after the service so we can get to know you a little bit and be able to invite you to our other events. And of course, there will be coffee and refreshments back in the common room. Until in-gathering, we are we have very few announcements. Some of our usual activities are continuing over the summer. But on August 19th, our big event is Reverend Nick's installation here at UUCA. And we hope to have as many people as possible to celebrate with food, music, and special guests. We have a very special sermon today. This is by Don Hostetler, who is a true elder of our church. He's been an active member for over 69 years and have served this church in so many capacities. It's fair to say that if it weren't for him, we probably wouldn't be here today. And he's also the founder of the Freethinkers Group, and he is presenting his 107th sermon, which is summing up a lot of the ideas, <laughs> summing up a lot of the ideas he's found the most important in his 93 years. So, Please relax now. Let us move into worship mode and be prepared for a very thoughtful service today. Our chalice lighting words are Hymn to the Light by David Breeden. Our light is the light of the sun, keeper of all we love. Our light is the light of the earth, provider of sustenance. Our light is the light of all living things, life precious like our own. Our light is the light of each of us, bound together in need and hope. Our light is the light of the cosmos, keeper of all we have known and all we will ever know. And Don will introduce our opening hymn. One of the consequences of hopefully reaching 93 on Tuesday is I uh, move slowly and the world is somewhat dimmer, so I will do my best to read what I have written. Betty and I are the last uh, remaining attendees at the first meeting of the Unitarian Fellowship of Augusta in 1954. I, as Jezebel noted, I've made a, quite a few sermons and in most of the recent ones, I've used a, as tranquil screams, which is in number 145 in your big hymnal. The first two and the last verse to me beautifully define what Unitarian Universalism is. I do not revere the past and certainly don't trust the dawning future more, so I've rewritten verse 3. A freedom that learns from the past and views the future as a door through which our minds in search of truth adventure boldly and explore. Okay, Joe. Please rise in body or spirit.
now it's gone. Now is the time in our service when we share our joys and sorrows for the week. Our first stone will be put in the for uh, all those who are not with us today, and the second for all of our military who are serving. Uh, there will be an opportunity for those on Zoom to give their uh, joys and sorrows, and if anyone who is interested, please come up and join me over here. And now is our time for meditation, so I invite everyone to center themselves, take a few deep breaths, Feel your feet on the ground, the earth supporting you, relax in your chair. This is Independence Day weekend, which brings up a lot of issues with some of our troublesome history. But our reading for our meditation is entitled Dependence Day, and it is by John Daniel. It would be a quieter holiday. No fireworks or loud parades, no speeches, no salutes to any flag. A day of staying home instead of crowding away. A day we celebrate nothing gained in war, but what we are given. How the sun's warmth is democratic, touching everyone, and that the rain is democratic too. How the strongest branches in the wind give themselves as they resist, resist, and give themselves how the birds could have no freedom without the planet's weight to wing against. How Earth itself could come to be only when a swirling cloud of dust pledged allegiance as a world, circling dependently around a star, and the star blossomed into fire from the ash of other stars. And once, at the dark zero of our time, a blaze of revolutionary light exploded out of nowhere, out of nothing, because nothing needed the light. <coughs> Brilliance of the light itself needs nothing. Individually and Together by Heather Christensen. Unitarian Universalism is a grand vision of a world filled with peace and justice, love and joy. That vision is embodied in a few large congregations, numerous mid-sized congregations, and many, many, many small congregations. 
no matter its size, every congregation depends on each of its members. Each one of you, by your commitment of time, energy, and resources, helps make that grand vision real. Individually and together, we are Unitarian Universalists, building a world filled with peace and justice, love and joy. And now we ask for your help in building that world. If the ushers would please come forward. And we thank you for these gifts that sustain our church. And now I'd like to welcome, ordinarily the term would be guest in the pulpit, but I feel like in this case, one of the founders of this pulpit, Don Hostetler. As I said, it's good to be back. I'm sorry Betty can't be here. She now needs a lot of sleep, and I'm sure is asleep now. I decided uh, I would like to do at least w one more sermon while I am still able. Truth, science, and religion have played important roles in my life, so I will try to summarize some of my thoughts. I'm sorry we no longer have a printed Sunday bulletin, but my title is Why the World Needs Consilience, Truth and Science and Religions, where consilience is the unity of knowledge of truth. I think I can describe my sermon today as a throwback and probably a one-off. Consilience, as I said, is the unity of knowledge. The biologist E.O. Wilson brought it out of the past in a book 20 years ago. Wilson is concerned with environmental issues and environmental policies. He suggests that we need agreement, consilience, in four areas. First, we need to agree on what the issues are and what policies are needed. These policies will affect all of us, so we need 
to consider the ethical issues. And of course, we need to agree on what biology tells us. And finally, we need to take advantage of what social sciences can tell us about how humans deal with the problems and hopefully how we can reach consilience. The questions science seeks to answer have only one answer. So science practices consilience. Science has many branches, physics, chemistry, psychology, anthropology. Scientists in each seek answers to questions in their areas of expertise. And they all accept the answers of the other branches. Psychologists may be looking into something that requires help from the chemists. I will be making some somewhat controversial statements I believe to be true. In fact, I believe everything I believe either to be true or in the best interest of myself, my family, or the larger community, depending on my level of altruism. But so do all of you. I've never met anybody who believes things they believe are not true. So now we run into the reason why, outside of science, consilience is difficult to achieve. I'm sure we can agree that the issue would be much easier to deal with if everyone agrees on the issues and the science involved. In this small group, we are likely have consilience on most social issues sexism, racism, global warming. On other issues, politics, the basis of Unitarian Universalism, we will find we hold many contradictory beliefs. So unless I believe I am the smartest person in the world, I have to face the fact that some of my beliefs are not true. How do we resolve this? is an important question. I would say by seeking consilience in religion, which means we need to apply the reasoned analysis to religions, including our own, as we do to all other groups. On to science. <clears throat> science has been the most successful human enterprise. It begins with questions, as I said, that have one answer. Does the earth go around the sun or the sun around the earth, as common sense tells us? How did life develop? Is human activity an important cause of global warming? <clears throat> Why science works, I think, is given in a nutshell by the physicist Richard Feynman. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess. No, don't laugh. That's really true. When we, then we compute the consequences of the guess to see if this law that we guess is right, what it would imply. Then we compare these computations to nature, or we say to experiment. or experience. We compare directly with observations to see if it works. If it disagrees with experiments, it's wrong. In that simple sentence is the key to science. It does not make any difference how beautiful the guess is. It doesn't make any difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or who, or what your name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. 
Science cannot give definitive answers to many questions involving values in life, but religions can't either, even though they claim to do so. What science can do is very important. It can tell us the consequences of our actions, but we have to make the choices. Science, as I said, science seeks answers to truths, but all answers are open to change. Answers at the core Relativity, quantum mechanics, evolution by natural selection seldom change. Answers on the border with the unknown often change until a consensus is reached. Again, quoting Feynman, the scientist has a lot of experience with ignorance and doubt and uncertainty, and this experience is of very great importance. Scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty, some most unsure, some nearly sure, but none absolutely certain. Science discovered how the heart works, including the function of the aortic valve. Technology was able to design a mechanical valve and a heart-lung machine that can replace the heart and lungs for a short while. Because of this, 25 years ago, when my bipolar aortic valve was calcifying shut, I am able to, was able to have it replaced with a mechanical valve that has opened and closed 800 million times since then. That's the kind of truth I can believe in. Now we come to religion. Note the plurals. While science starts with the search for truth, religions start with the truth. Usually the ideas of a person, as one person, that become unchangeable dogma. Paul, Muhammad, the Buddha, Confucius, Joseph Smith, Mary Baker Eddy. Adherents line up and defend the truth sometimes to the death. The core truths are encapsulated into creeds. Creeds are anchors that hold these truths in place. Creeds are very difficult to change. So they so if one disagrees with a creed, the only choice is to leave, set up a new group, and write new creeds. So the major religions have their anchor in truths contained in a book or a hierarchy. These truths have their origin in what I call flat earth theology, that is their basic ideas about the universe and life come from an era when we knew nothing about how the universe works. Now we have a coherent picture of the universe from near its beginning to the present profusion of life, but flat earth theology still dominates. People are willing to accept advances in medicine and modern conveniences that are based on the scientific picture, but in religion want to pretend the knowledge does not exist. So the Greek Orthodox split from Roman Catholicism, and then the Protestants left the Catholics and rapidly divided into several thousand denominations. Someone has estimated there are 10,000 religions, each of which differs in at least one belief from the other 9,999. The leaders of the 10,000 have no interest in evaluating their truth in the context of the others and seeking conciliance. 
I have the fan fantasy of Jesus, Paul, Mohammed, and the Buddha sitting around the table. Jesus would likely be bewildered what has been developed in his name. Paul and Mohammed would be pleased with what they have done and sit there arguing. The Buddha, the only intellectual in the group, came to seek conciliance, but sees the utility and sits there in sad silence, shaking his head. So what religions call truth are beliefs, some of which are true. These beliefs have led to hundreds of religious wars that are still going on. And it has led people to fly airplanes into buildings and bomb abortion clinics. But the 10,000 also includes Quakers, Mennonites, and my Amish relatives who are pacifists, and many others religions that do have a positive effect on the world. It includes those who worship no gods, Buddhism and Confucianism, one God, Judaism and Islam, three-in-one Christianity and many, Hinduism. Most Western religions no longer are, are no longer openly racist, but some are. Many oppose sexism, but others are still male-dominated. Many support abortion. For others, it is still a sin. The United Methodist Church is no longer uni united. They are in the process of splitting into churches who support the ordination of gay ministers and those who don't. One, space, I, one thing I suggest you use need to think carefully about inclusion, diversity, and multiple truths. My title is Science and Religions, not science versus religion. Many believe science is hostile to religion and that science is atheistic. Neither of these beliefs are true. Scientists doing science are employing method <coughs> methodological naturalism. My definition of naturalism is the concept that everything about the universe from atoms to zen, matter to ideas, is understandable via the interaction of matter and energy. Atheists deny the existence of God. Naturalists ignore the existence or non-existence of God and go about seeking their answers via the laws of nature. In doing so, they find no evidence for the intervention of a god or gods, but have no reason to deny existence. It's up to believers to prove existence, not non-believers to prove non-existence. So far, everything from the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago through the evolution of life is consistent with a completely natural universe. If it's sometime in the future, natural explanations fail and science will have to consider the supernatural. I do not expect this to happen. However, many religions deny some of the discoveries of science and I think I've already said this, they accept many conveniences, but refuse to accept evolution and other aspects. Can science do anything to accommodate religious beliefs? The answer is no. Scientists have no choice about what they discover and have no way to compromise. 
one of the consequences of holding on to truth, uh, of starting with the truth and holding on to it without testing it, is that one is stuck with truths perceived at a time in the past. All were reasonable when first conceived. It was obvious that the sun goes around the earth. It is reasonable that germs begin in decaying vegetation. Seeing the dead in dreams makes survival of a soul plausible. The result has been essentially every idea that religions have learned from nature about the natural world have proved to be wrong. 2,000 years ago, birth control would have meant the end of civilization. Large fraction of babies and children died before their 10th birthday, and humans needed all the babies they could produce. But now living in a world with finite resources and too many people, Civilizations may end for the lack of birth control. And now on a, what, what is called a religious landscape is changing. Another group needs to be included with science and religion. An increasingly large group of people view themselves as religious, but claim no religious affiliation. Another large group <laughs> yeah. I'll get back to it. And another large group of non-believers who are out of religion. Some of the, some of these, well, <laughs> I miss one important sentence. These, these, these people have been labeled the nuns. N-O-N-E-S. And right now, a third of Americans consider themselves nuns, and the number is increasing. Gallup started polling about belief in God and religion in the 1940s, when 96% of American adults were believers. In a poll last year, the belief was down to 81% in the U.S., and non-believers are a majority in Western Europe where many, most of the churches are closed. My guess is the nuns hold more liberal views than church members and could be a valuable ally. But effectively dealing with issues requires organized groups governments, political parties, religions, nonprofits. The nuns are not organized and can only influence by voting. I wish I had an answer for achieving consilience. We live in a crazy world where the right to own assault rifles is more important than the lives lost by from assault rifles. Only one in 2,000 Americans are members of a Unitarian Universalist Church. So one thing is certain. If you want to go beyond talking about it on Sunday morning and having any influence, you will have to work with others. Anything we do to try to solve the world issues will involve religions like it or not. But many potential allies are out there, many religions and nonprofits. An example is the Progressive Religious Coalition, 
that Andy has been involved with for many years. And do not forget the growing group of nuns. Encourage them to realize the importance of organizing. Maybe nuns united. Well, after 15 minutes or so with, of coffee, you're invited to come back in here for a sermon discussion. I will ring the bell in the lobby. At a few, some years ago, elevator speech was a buzzword. How do you define UUism during an elevator ride? My elevator speech would be, Unitarian Universalism is a reasoned approach, search for truth with the goal of ethical living in the here and now within the interconnected web of all existence. Our closing words are by Calvin O'Dame. May our time together renew our hope. May the stories we share refresh our courage. May the songs we sing lift our spirits. May the words we speak invigorate us. May the touch of hands, the sound of laughter, the sight of faces new and familiar restore us in faith. Amen. Blessed be. Spirit of life.